वेरी गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन आई एम डॉक्टर अजिंक्य फ्रॉम एम क्यूर फार्मास्यूटिकल्स आई वेलकम एवरीवन टू येट अनदर सेशन ऑफ द नॉर्थ थ्रोम्बोसिस वर्कशॉप फोकसिंग ऑन द एक्यूट इस्टेमिक स्ट्रोक द ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ दिस वर्कशॉप इज टू शो केस यूनिक केसेस इन द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ एक्यूट इस्टेमिक स्ट्रोक एंड what happened got disconnected i think uh, maybe i think because of the live streaming i think it's got uh, i think so i think he is he has to come back you're on mute i think yeah. you're on mute yeah. yeah yeah am i audible sir now uh, yeah yeah yes. definitely yeah yeah so the objective of this workshop is to showcase unique cases in the management of acute ischemic stroke and gain insights from the moderators and the wisdom shared by our course director in the previous workshops we had a pleasure of engaging in very unique and interesting case discussions and we are looking forward to have a very fruitful discussion today as well and it is my honor uh, to introduce uh, our faculty for today's session so let me share my screen so i first welcome uh, dr m pradeep sir uh, we, who will be the our course director for tonight's session sir is chief neurologist at umed super specialty hospital palakkad kerala he is a recipient of prestigious national merit scholarship and university merit scholarship sir has been coordinator in india for two years of nsrg of the world federation of neurology he has been chairman of indian medical association continuously for 2 years from 2004 and 2006 and of the scientific committee for the kerala state conference of the ima in 2006 sir has delivered the prestigious silver jubilee oration at medical college kalikat on the recent advances in the management of stroke he has also delivered a lecture on the occasion of annual conference of the international medical sciences academy which was organized by the royal college of physicians edinburgh and he also got an appreciation from the president of the rcp for the same sir has been involved in the research project on the stroke at the national university of singapore in 2015 and has original research work on tenetic place in ais and also a principal investigator for tenetic place in stroke trial conduct which was conducted in india he has been a national and international faculty for multiple scientific meetings and conferences and won many awards like doctor of excellence award by padma shri dr g uh, baktawal salam sir uh, best doctor award by giants international and also a state award for the best chairman of the ima sir has more than 15 publications in various national as well as international uh, journals uh, welcome sir welcome for tonight's session Uh, then i welcome our moderator uh, first moderator for uh, tonight's session dr anshu rodki sir sir is consultant neurologist at sir gangaram hospital new delhi and professor of neurology at gangaram institute of Pro post graduate medicine and research sir has been a secretary of delhi neurological association from 2021 and onwards he is a sec joint secretary of association of neurologist in clinical research mumbai and coordinator for national accreditation board for hospitals and international organization for standardization for neurology sir has been pri uh, principal investigator in more than 24 studies like vita top profess etc he has over 47 publications in various reputed national and international journals sir has presented more than 25 scientific papers at various conferences in a guest faculty at many prestigious neurological meetings and conferences welcome again sir welcome for uh, no thank you thank you uh, then i welcome our uh, second moderator for tonight's session dr jayanta roy sir sir is a director of stroke program and senior consultant at department of neurology institute of neurosciences kolkata sir is a certified neurosonologist accredited uh, by american society of neuroimaging in 2005 He is a recipient of 2005 American Society of Neurology 
William M. McKinney Award for the best manuscript based on the clinical research in neurosonology. He is a executive committee member of Society of Neurosonology India and has been a member of educational committee of the Joint World Stroke Congress Hyderabad. Sir has over 36 publications in various reputed national and international journals and has been an editor of the various neurology books. Uh, uh, sir has been a guest faculty as well at many prestigious national and international neurological meetings and conferences as well. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, then I welcome our first expert speaker for uh, today's No Thrombosis Workshop, Dr. Vinit Banga, sir. Sir is an associate director and neurology uh, at Neurology and head of neurovascular intervention at BLK Max Super Speciality Hospital, New Delhi. And he has received a World Stroke Organization Young Strokes Professional Scholarship and the award for the most, uh, best poster at the IonCon in 2018 in Raipur. Sir has won SV, uh, SNVCon uh, 2017 quiz and also won a gold medal in MD Internal Medicine. Sir has memberships of Indian, Indian Stroke Association, WFITN, uh, Delhi Medical Council, Indian Academy of Neurology, and he has participated uh, participated in 14 CMEs and conferences. Sir has multiple posters and paper presentations at various conferences and also has done multiple publications. Welcome, sir. Uh, then I welcome our second expert uh, speaker for tonight's session, Dr. Swaleha Nadap, ma'am. Uh, she is an assistant professor in neurology at Topiwala National Medical College and Nair Hospital, Mumbai. She has a uh, total 10 years of teaching experience and has been a part of five clinical trials. Ma'am has more than 10 publications in national and international journals and has won multiple awards like best paper in neurology award at Bombay Neurosciences Association in 2016, 17 and 18. Uh, Ma'am has five paper and poster presentations at various conferences as well. The skills and trainings uh, are, are as follows, stroke management, intracranial bleeds, acute transverse myelitis, electroencephalogram, electromyography, nerve conduction stu studies, somatosensory uh, evo potential, uh, botulinum toxin injections, and occipital nerve blocks. Uh, welcome, ma'am. So with this uh, introduction, uh, I would like to hand over this uh, session to our course director, Dr. M. Pradeep sir, uh, for his opening comments and the context setting. Uh, sir, over to you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Dr. Ajinkya. Good evening, the MQ group for organizing such a wonderful meeting. You know that, uh, see, knowing thrombosis is very, very important for all neurologists who practice stroke medicine. Stroke management, as you are all aware, is a very interesting field which has evolved considerably during the last few years, actually. It was rather a dormant field a couple of years ago, maybe the previous decade. But since the advent of newer molecules, newer methodology of uh, stroke management, acute ischemic stroke management especially, the management strategy has changed considerably because of the extensive research work which has gone into it, both medicine-wise as well as the gadget-wise which can remove the clot. So in this context, we have two excellent speakers today, Dr. Vineet Banka and Dr. Soleha Nada, who will be presenting the interesting cases on uh, acute stroke. And two excellent moderators we have, both are great friends of mine. And uh, we are going to have a very interesting, excellent academic feast. Over to the moderators for uh, continuing the session. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, thank you very much for setting the stage. As usual, good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we are now waiting to hear from our two young colleagues. And I think Dr. Banga will be the first presenter, right? Uh, no, sir. He will be joining in a few minutes. Uh, we can start with Dr. Swaleha, ma'am. Okay. So can I okay. uh, invite Dr. Swaleha, please? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, today, <clears throat> is it visible? Yeah, it is. 
Your video is not visible, Doctor Swila. Ah, uh, yes, sir. You are not visible. <laughs> One minute, sir. Uh, but is the slide is being uh, slide is uh, seen? Now the slide is also gone off. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, now it's on. So, yeah. Can you go to the first slide? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so I'll be discussing a short case. Uh, patient was 19 year old uh, male. He presented with history of recurrent episodes of right sided tingling numbness and weakness. <clears throat> So, 19-year-old male pre uh, presented with history of recurrent episodes of right-sided tingling numbness and weakness of the right side. And he also complained of episodes of slurring of uh, speech. This was going on for almost 4-5 days. Uh, he got almost 7-8 to eight episodes of uh, right-sided tingling and numbness which lasted for 5-10 to 10 minutes and recovered completely. After that, he developed uh, right-sided numbness uh, and right-sided uh, uh, weakness, uh, uh, grip weakness. Um, after uh, three to four episodes of uh, this uh, TI, and uh, during that time, he also developed slurring of speech. So he uh, he was describing the tingling like uh, it started from the toes of the right leg, and then it extended up slowly, slowly on the right half of body, and then it went up to the right side of uh, right arm, and then right half of face, and uh, along with that, he started developing slurring of speech. और कहां से चालू होता था कहां पे रहता था पैर से चालू होता था वो पैर से चालू होता था और ऊपर जाता था और 5 मिनट रह गए खत्म हो गया जब कमजोरी का मतलब हाथ उठ ही नहीं रहा था या मुंह टेढ़ा हो गया था बात करने को नहीं आ रहा था ऐसा कुछ नहीं ओके कितने बार ऐसे बार-बार टिंगलिंग हुआ है और हमें तक कितने टाइम के लिए रुका था मतलब भाई 5 मिनट 5 मिनट Actually, I'm not able to move to the next slide. You can uh, try uh, uh, pressing the page down button, ma'am. Page down or the right click mouse and next slide. No, no, it's not happening. Go to ESC and come out from the full screen mode. Yeah, I'm trying that only. It's not happening. Looks like it's frozen. Yeah. I, it, I I think it's back now. Ma'am, you can uh, try from the next slide from uh, of that video. One minute, one minute. It's frozen again. Uh, you can uh, present in this mode, ma'am, as well. You just share yeah, your one screen. Minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. Okay. <clears throat> Is it seen? Not yet. Not yet. Oh. Uh, Ma'am, uh, do you need any assistance? No, no, no. I am able to oh. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, is it visible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's visible. So, I'll show in this uh, format only. I think. Yes. So this was his uh, MRI. It showed the uh, left um, uh, parietal, high parietal uh, infarct. Then there was one uh, in the thalamus also. Uh, and then there was one in the posterior limb of internal capsule. Uh, these three localizations uh, locations were there, which were correlating. Actually, parietal infarct was correlating with his right upper limb and lower limb tingling numbness. Uh, 
and uh, there was a little bit of uh, imbalance of the right side so that was also correlating with the location of the stroke and these uh, signal uh, lesions were restricting on uh, diffusion uh, i'll just uh, show the angiography this was the mri angiography which was normal um this was a repeat scan that i had done which showed again the enlargement of the previous stroke and nothing uh, new so there was no history of prior such episodes no history of smoking or drug abuse no vaccines or fever and no cardiac history in the past um, so looking at the mri looking at the mri this look like a um, multi uh, multi territory embolic strokes so because of which i further uh, investigated the patient and did the 2d echo and the 2d echo was uh, normal so then uh, decided to go ahead with the work up for the young stroke which included uh, hb electrophoresis ana blot anka apla profile esr crp and other coagulation uh, work up was also negative but the strokes kept on uh, they looked like embolic strokes so patient uh, we advise uh, advise the patient to undergo bubble <coughs> echo bubble uh, transthoracic echocardiography and uh, it showed a small uh, pfo basically there was a moderate right to left shunt through the pfo and length of the pfo was 4 mm and pfo aperture was 0.5 mm so um, if we apply the rope score for this patient uh, there is no background history of hypertension and diabetes no history of stroke or ti no uh, patient was a non smoker and patient had cortical strokes on imaging and patient was 18 year old so if we apply this um, uh, rope score his uh, score goes around uh, uh, 5 plus 1 and then the rest of this so it goes ab about 10 rope score and uh, pascal score if you uh, pascal class there is another one which is a pascal classification so uh, if um, uh, uh, the resource is very high if is a there is a pfo and a straddling thrombus and uh, if it it is high if there is concomitant pe or dvt and preceding index infarct combined with pfo uh, and atrial uh, septal defect or a large shunt pfo uh, it's a medium risk if it's a pfo and an asa or a large shunt pfo it's a low risk if small shunt pfo without an asa and the rope score definitely if it is 0 to 6 it is low and if it is more than 7 it is high score uh so looking at this patient uh what should have been done further that was the question whether this pfo is actually the causative behind the stroke or it is just associated incidental finding or it is just a risk factor what should have been done whether the pfo closure should have been attempted that was the uh, the discussion point the rope score was high in this patient So what did you decide to do so i uh, ended up giving a uh, antiplatelets uh, i ended up giving a uh, single antiplatelet and, and uh, took a cardio opinion also sir so mm -hmm. according to them the the size of the uh, pfo the morphology of the pfo was uh, too small to or not very significant to explain the recurrent uh, i mean explain the strokes so according to him it was not sufficient to cause the stroke yeah. so that's why then it was avoided and then they is currently on just uh, dual antiplatelets sir dual antiplatelets okay so uh, okay so how is the patient doing now he has not done now it's been 3 months he has not uh, got any repeat episode Okay. So, but uh, you were not able to find any other source for the uh, no other the, source. Yes, no sir, other no. source. So that means no, that it, it was uh, basically happening because of the PFO most likely, because you were able to demonstrate a right to left shunt. Huh? Yes, sir. There were uh, there there was and it was a moderate shunt actually. Hmm. Here, the what they have reported is moderate right to left shunt through okay. PFO. Okay. Hmm. And is it? Associated in resting conditions or only in valsalva? Ah, uh, ha. 
हाँ दैट दे मेंशन दैट इट इज प्रेजेंट मैक्सिम इन द रेस्टिंग कंडीशंस आल्सो दैट शंट इज देयर इन द रेस्टिंग कंडीशन आल्सो ओके ऑल राइट सो व्हाई ड्यूअल एंटीप्लेटलेट्स डू दे हैव एनी एडवांटेज ओवर सिंगल एंटीप्लेटलेट इन पीएफओ व्हेन यू मैनेज देयर मेडिकल रिपोर्ट सर एक्चुअली because there were uh, small but repeated episodes sir initially he was on ecosprin and mm-hmm. on that he got uh, uh, tis he got almost 4 to 5 per day and then uh, that's why we uh, i shifted him to double antiplatelets okay but uh, once we did not get any vascular disease uh, and or any any uh, dissection or anything so in that case probably dual antiplatelet is not going to add any uh, advantage over whatever single antiplatelet you choose so yes, at least in the long run so yes, since be enough and regarding the 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 question of uh, closing the pfo i think hmm. uh, this is too small uh, and the risk overall is also less hmm. as per the criteria so in this case i would rather continue to manage medically this patient unless the patient still gets uh, repeated events despite medical management then i'll de- decide about closing the pfo so i will ask opinion from my other colleagues if they yeah, yeah. yeah. dr jayendra you are absolutely right dr pradi actually in this particular case you know mm-hmm. what another thing which you should do is that you you have to do uh, whether there is any what is the source of the embolus mm-hmm. you just you just detected a pfo that's all Correct. you just detect what is the is there a definite source for the embolus you should do a, a venous study actually in this patient to find out whether there is any thrombus in the pelvic uh, veins or in the veins of the lower leg to to cause an embolic phenomenon so your long term anti coagulation depends on fundamentally what is the thrombus load what is a, is there a cause of those of uh, emboli that has to be detected first uh, then of course you have done the i would say this uh, even though the size of the size of the pfo is small then why was it causing such recurrent uh, embolic episodes that means there is some some constant source of emboli which is happening there which has to be detected and it, if needed that has to be tackled also first and foremost rather than just concentrating on the uh, small size pfo we should detect the source of the embolization what do you say jento yeah uh, i think so i think uh, the young boy and uh, small pfo th- these are not uh, very uncommon yeah didn't yeah. finding in a normal population so very difficult to correlate between the two and yeah. i th- uh dr saleh has uh, investigated in detail about all other um prothrombotic causes uh, as as we do see young strokes and one more thing i want to tell you if you yeah. look at the mri picture which he showed everything mm-hmm. was concentrating on one hemisphere right multiple so why should it happen in a pfo why should it happen in a pfo it, see it pfo it can go to it can go to either hemisphere actually why recurrently going on to the one if if uh, i think we have to uh, study this patient in detail rather than just implicating the pfo alone because it is uh, it is localizing to left it is localizing to the left hemisphere all the time whenever he is getting this recurrent attack so there is something much more than the small size pfo which could be responsible for the whole thing right and and i mean uh, in my practice in young when i do not have a good explanation i always do a dsa just to make sure that do the vascular anatomy in detail yeah. and more uh, clear do the mr angio quality looks pretty good but still dsa is probably a very good investigation in investigate young strokes when you do not have a clear explanation from other things so very right very yeah. true Please. I think I think this is I think uh, Doctor Pati, I can prevent. Yeah, very important point. I think because all these infarcts are happening in only one territory, so I think uh, DSA is definitely. Actually, sir, uh, 
yeah actually sir we did the dsa uh, recently we did the dsa uh, so that was also normal they did not find anything in that sir dsa okay okay that's good but you know i mean young strokes uh, dissections are sometimes uh, yeah and they do heal uh, on their own if there is a 2 to 3 months gap some spontaneous dissections they do heal so i think uh, antiplatelet at this moment for this patient post follow up and uh, i think uh, unless there is a recurrence then we think differently right maybe a repeat dsa after a couple of months yeah i mean yes that is or or maybe a good quality ct angio sometimes can Perfect. do Perfect. That, yeah that's right avoid another dsa yeah mm, i think this is one interesting uh, case uh so we would prefer a single antiplatelet rather than two i think that's yes right. sir after three months uh, actually i have uh, changed it to now single only 75 kusrin only yeah. uh, he is better he is not have had, uh, had any episode fresh episode So, uh, so just uh, one slide the cryptogenic strokes are like 10 to 15% of uh, all ischemic strokes pfo occurs in uh, 40 to 50% of patients less than 50 uh, 55 year old with cryptogenic stroke or tis one has to distinguish uh, between pfo being a direct toxicological embolism or in situ clot formation or because of arrhythmias so anatomical features are important to predict whether uh, pfo is responsible for the stroke for example uh, the size of pfo more than 2 mm or larger shunt uh, can be a cause smaller shunt are associated with high recurrence especially if the rope score more than 7 and hypermobile atrial septum if the pfo length is more than 8 mm that is also another high risk factor so higher the rope score more likely to be that the pfo is pathogenic and rope score 0 to 3 is 0% probability of pathogenicity but um, uh, 20% probability of recurrence this uh, concept i did not understand that the rope score 0 to 3 uh, has a pathogenic risk 0% but the recurrence risk is 20% that i did not understand and even the score of 9 to 10 have 88% path, uh, pathogenic risk but the pro, uh, rec recurrence risk is only 2% and this concept i actually did not uh, i wanted to ask actually why the recurrence rate is uh, high if the rope score is less i don't know what they exactly meant uh, word by word but look mm. these are all probability estimates and in a given patient it is very difficult to connect between the dots and whether this is really the 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 cause for this particular stroke mm -hmm. so i think they have to give a judgment on uh, on the on the whole perspective and uh, and we should also valander right parayinda phone na ne poitta alla but namukku oru kitta paisa thirichu kodukkandi varum paisa vaangiyittatte Oh, hundred rupees. Peter, the doctor informed you. After the doctor, check. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, and I, I hope the homocysteine and other metabolic parameters are normal for this young boy. Yeah. yeah yes, sir. All normal. Everything normal. Okay. So, I think as we already decided, a single antiplatelet mm -hmm. and uh, and follow up for the time. Yes, sir. Though. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other question or points, or should we proceed for the next? Case? I think we can move to the next case. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, Doctor uh, Varun has joined, and uh, Doctor Vinit uh, sir uh, also joined. So, Doctor Vinit Doctor, sir. Doctor Nisha, hi, hi. Uh, I'm yeah. extremely sorry uh, for the delay. Actually, uh, I've got to be in lab for some emergency. So, uh, Doctor Nishant uh, will be presenting on my behalf uh, the case, and he'll begin. And I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, 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 throughout the case. I'll be there, but uh, uh, he'll be presenting on my behalf. Okay. Okay, sure. sir. Yeah, Doctor Nishant, sir, uh, you can share your screen, sir. 
ओके सर Sir, do you need any assistance in sharing the screen? I think I'm not able to get the file uh, on this app. It is, it is saved on the desktop, but I think I'm not able to access that. You can copy paste in uh, the drive if possible. Yeah, it's visible, sir. Visible? You can switch to yeah, yeah, yeah. You can switch to slideshow more. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. Sir. Yes, this 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 one, sir. Yeah. Something else is coming. Is it visible now? So yeah, it's visible. Good evening to everyone. I am Dr. Nishan. Uh, on behalf of Vinit sir, I am just presenting this as uh, a rare case of stroke in young and how we came to etiological diagnosis of this case particularly. I am a, a DNB resident here. Uh, so to begin with the history or historical part, uh, he is a young uh, ma male of 45 years of age, educated, uh, working cur currently in a Delhi plus, is right-handed and as a resident of Delhi. He was admitted with chief complaints of recurrent history of right arm weakness, followed by a slurring of uh, speech since past six months. During the past six months, he had nearly three episodes. The first episode, uh, he noticed he was traveling with his friends to Shimla. Uh, then what happened? There was suddenly while eating food, he had the right arm weakness and this was associated with slurring of speech. And the event lasted for nearly five to 10 minutes and spontaneously it recovered. But the moment and the arm of we uh, weakness in the arm was significant uh, from the historical perspective and to the patient also. Uh, although it recovered, but he was a uh, bit conscious about this fact. The next thing he went to doctor for the same thing. Although there was no weakness in any part of the other part of the body apart from that weakness. And there was no loss of consciousness. He was evaluated at outside there only in Shimla itself, and he and he was found to have a left MC territory infarct, which was very tiny infarct, and he was put on antiplatelet tab tablet ecosprin AV seventy or twenty combination was given, and he was subsequently sent home, and he was ultimately fine. Also, he was doing normal routine work. He was he has already joined uh, duties. Then what happened nearly uh, the second episode happened after nearly of two months of that. And it was all of the same semiology nearly. Uh, there was right arm weakness with slurring of speech and the event, this event also lasted for nearly five to 10 minutes. But this episode was associated with subtle confusional state at that moment. And he was transient, transiently not able to communicate uh, with the caretakers and who were just, he was not aware of the surroundings also. And this event also recovered spontaneously. And when he went for this episode to the doctor, uh, he had came back in Delhi and he went to some other hospital. Uh, Anti-epileptics were added uh, to this episode. And this all semiology was thought that it is the seizure etiology, which is just pertaining. And he was put on some antiplatelets. Uh, he was put on uh, Levaracetam 500 and he was just, he was also fine with that. And subsequently what happened, even after taking anti-epileptics, nearly two, three months of that, uh, just a prior uh, to the day of admission, he had the same kind of semiology of right arm weakness transiently. And this time also he came to emergency. And at that time when the MRI was done, it was found to be an acute stroke. It was positive in the diffusion as well as it was positive in the flare. 
uh, it was a non disabling uh, non disabling stroke and the patient at that time when he visited the emergency he had already recovered of that event and he uh, uh, already took ecosprin when he, he when he developed this episode uh, he also uh, communicated with the previous hospital for the same reason and he was th- and he was told that this might be a seizure episode uh, but ultimately you can come to the hospital and uh, see what can we do for you then when he came t- uh, to the hospital uh, it was found to be a stroke uh, rather than a a seizure it was seizure uh, then he was admitted subsequently and, and his routine all the r- routine was done and history was evaluated from the beginning to uh, this nearly 2 3 months landed up during this time and he had recurrent three episodes uh, of of all these and all had nearly same symptoms but the last one was a bit more prolonged as compared to the previous one a uh, normal ct angiography was done to just find out whether there is a, some small vessel occlusion uh, but it was absolutely normal and as a part of stroke routine workup uh, after planning a normal baseline investigations normal echo holter then we subsequently also go for the trans esophageal echo echo and that also sub- subsequently was normal and found to be have there was no intracardiac abnormalities uh atrial fibrillation Uh, was also to be ruled out and uh, and holter was also turned out to be negative and subsequently an extended loop recorder was also done for that uh, for that matter just to pick up if there one was any uh, cardiac atrial fibrillation that was contributing and vasculitic were ana ana na profile an ka pn ka all were sent and all were within normal limit uh, then uh, we went to do uh, go ahead with the step of dsa when the dsa was done uh, there was different images which were taking uh, of the dsa and it was found that uh, during the arterial phase as well as by the uh, during the venous phase there was a spaces of the blood uh, transiently in the uh, carotid carotid region mainly as you can see in the first film during uh, during the filling phase you can see a stagnant of the stagnation of the dye uh even when the venous phase is just coming out in the subsequent also it was found that there was a more prolongation of the uh, of the stasis of the dye in that part and in the third image also it is also obvious that there was a uh, stasis of the dye even in the venous phase and subsequently it was found and the literature was reviewed uh, uh, we thought that it might be a A, a typical presentation of a carotid web uh, carotid web usually is a very ra- uh, rarely uh, rare diagnosis and does not present very often oftenly it is it is present in most of the cases but not easy to pick up uh, then we went ahead to uh, give anticoagulation to the patient and patient was put on aliquis twice daily and ongoing at antiepileptics were stopped and nearly uh, nearly past seven months into the illness he is continuing aliquis and there was no subsequent episodes of uh, of any uh, of of the same uh, hemiparetic event or some clouding or con- confusion and there was not uh, not not present uh, just to sum up that uh, the gist of the case was that uh, in a, in a young patient especially the semiology is a typical localized to a particularly territory Uh, we have to also look out for the vascular causes and in that cases the dsa study was suggested as a prolongation of the dye or there was a more stasis uh, of the dye in the right carotid part uh, it was diagnosed to have a case of a carotid web and carotid web usually is treated traditionally with antiplatelets or anticoagulation but the data perceived is not neither beneficial for both of the cases but anticoagulation is more preferred as uh, there are more chances of the atheroma formation and subsequently leading to the emboli formation uh, so carotid web is a non atheromatous uh, non dissecting membrane like strain that protrudes into the lumen of the carotid artery uh, there is a high risk of stroke recurrence that may be explained by flow stagnation along the superior surface of the septum that leads to the formation of a superimposed thrombus and ultimately that can lead to cerebral embolization a uh, carotid web uh, is generally not a common entity and it is known by different names 
and it is not easy to pick up uh, it is very difficult even to pick up in the ct scans normal ultrasound if we do a carotid doppler it is often missed uh, carotid web like formations uh, or a carotid pseudo valvular folds carotid shelves uh, carotid diaphragm or thrombotic carotid mega bulbs the prevalence is very under recognized in case of strokes in various trials it has been shown nearly 2.5% of the patient with acute stroke uh, with a large vessel may have a may have a pertaining uh, underlying carotid web as the etiological cause uh, in very in, in a prospective series of young cryptogenic stroke the incidence of recurrent stroke in patients with carotid web was found to be nearly 29% while in other stages uh, the the percentage may be as higher as 74% uh due due to carotid web the recurrent event is most of the time within 12 months of the detection and carotid web is mostly located in the posterior wall of the carotid uh, bulb it is hardly detected by ultrasonography uh, and it may appear similar to atherosclerotic plaque and it is often missed in, uh, due to that reason ct angiography and digital subsection uh, subsection angiography have been demonstrated to be a optimal neuroimaging to identify carotid webs and in that to carotid uh you know, web is more easily picked uh, more easy to diagnose in case of dsa rather than a ct angiography and in uh, dsa also we have to take different images at different uh, angle just to position and localize the carotid web in a, a good way and there are regarding the treatment there are no randomized control trial regarding the treatment whether we should go for antiplatelets whether we should go, go for anticoagulation but as in our case the patient was already on antiplatelets So, but in spite of that the patient had recurrent episodes of seizures uh, hemiparesis and so ultimately we decided to put him on anticoagulation although there is also not strong evidence whether we should go for an anticoagulation or antiplatelet uh clinical presentation may be uh, may be in same form of recurrent ischemic stroke or recurrent transient ischemic attacks especially in young patients and in one study it was found to be a, a recurrent case of uh, stroke maybe as high as 29% may have carotid web as an underlying cause otherwise they are mostly asymptomatic and non and non do not cause anything to the patient also uh, digital uh, subsection angiography is considered the gold standard imaging for mortality for detecting the carotid webs Uh, whereby most of the carotid contrast is seen to pool in the web even in the venous phase uh, spontaneous intra carotid uh, it is also known as spontaneous internal carotid artery dissection flap and dissection is generally more distal along the carotid uh, artery and has more irregular borders and may cause increase in the arterial diameter from uh, leading to formation of pseudo aneurysm or a atherosclerotic plaque which tend to have more irregular border and Uh, may also be distal to the internal carotid bulb and may have to be associated with calcifications uh, thank you uh, thank you dr varun uh, it's a very interesting case of young stroke so uh, there are few points i like to make here yes, sir. first of all uh, yes uh, this patient had a recurrent stereotype tia involving the left mcl territories and first thing is what you showed in the dsa this stasis of the dye and then it clears off can it be a um, a dissected flap i mean the the false lumen when the dye goes in and then out through the dissected flap because the reason i'm telling this as you know that the, the carotid webs are basically the scaffolding mm -hmm. and the the carotid wall mostly from the posterior part a little distant from the bulb because the that, that is the difference with the atherosclerotic plaques so usually they are very well visible filling defects if you do uh, proper mip in the ct angio i mean each and every carotid web i have seen though this is rare but they are very well picked up in the in, in the ct angio so how the ct angio missed a carotid web which is causing a stroke like this this is one point is actually surprising me and the second point is uh, i mean as you, as i already told that the stasis of the dye and then do you have any any uh, dsa picture of that uh, rather than the uh, cine you have any still picture of dsa of that level and see 
whether we can see any uh, feeling defect. Can you go a little slow frame by frame and see? Uh, it's more like a tapering thing. And if you look at the, uh, the uh, pictures of carotid wave in the image or even the pathological uh, specimen, they are like a scaffold. They, they protrude at the lumen like a shelf. So this, this uh, morphology I'm missing in this picture. So uh, I was wondering whether this could be a dissected flap and, and the dye is going to the false lumen and getting, getting uh, and then going through another aperture and clearing off. So I will uh, ask my other colleagues also what is their you know, take on this. And this is and the third point is uh, carotid web uh, anticoagulation. Uh, of course, this is not a very uh, a regular thing we do in carotid web rather than um, putting them on antiplatelets. And if a carotid wave continues to throw thrombus, despite somebody on antiplatelets, then stenting is another option to, to treat that, rather than putting them on anticoagulation, because that is not supported by much of the evidence. So I think these are the three points I'd like to make here. So Dr. Pradeep Ratanshu. Yeah, I, I think the point here is that uh, actually, because we are uh, we are not able to see that uh, this thing on the CT angle, which is very unusual for a carotid web. Correct. And uh, did you do a uh, carotid duplex ultrasound also? Yes, a carotid Doppler ultrasound didn't pick up anything. Didn't pick up anything. Yes. And I think what Dr. Jainta is also saying is that normally if you have a symptomatic carotid web, then I think the treatment of of choice, uh, if the patient is still symptomatic, uh, is I think is a carotid stenting is a is a good option. Because what the literature review of the literature really says that uh, is uh, that angioplasty or, or stenting is better than uh, medical management because the rate of recurrence is less. Right. And uh, uh, so I think that is a very important point. And I think uh, this is very unusual that the uh, CT angio was not able to pick it up. So he's right. Actually, this could be a dissection. This could be a dissection. So just to Good evening, sir. Uh, Dr. Vineet this side. Uh, so Aage, uh, Vineet, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> sir, 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 uh, there, there has been uh, some uh, issues with the case. So actually, we did not give anticoagulation. So this patient was admitted with uh, double antiplatelets. Uh, we gave him double antiplatelets. And while he was in hospital, he had PIAs. On one day, he had three PIAs. So then I was called and we did a DSA and we found that it is in web there. So what we did was we instead of giving anticoagulation, probably Nishant has uh, mistaken it to be another case. We have stented this case. We have oh. put in a C guard stent, and the patient immediately stopped having any TIAs. And uh, you're very right uh, that uh, the differential diagnosis of a carotid web is a dissection flap, but and it's very rare and it's a cross-sectional diagnosis. Actually, carotid web is a cross-sectional diagnosis. It's not a, a DSA diagnosis. Uh, but it, we were we, we were surprised to know, like we discussed with our radio radiology colleagues as well, because I was having doubts that he is having carotid web on a cross sectional CT angio. But the radiology colleagues were saying that it is not a web, and uh, uh, we diagnosed it on DSA. And usually the location is typical, which was here as well. It's almost at the bifurcation, and if you if you see uh, the image, uh, he doesn't have a VD, uh, uh, static image. He has only uh, videos. So uh, there is a, a, a scaffolding there, there where there is, uh, uh, there is stasis. So we did stand this and uh, he has been doing very well. So uh, uh, I'm not sure like why the CT NGO did not pick. And usually if I make a diagnosis of uh, carotid web, even if we do just the DSA, we go back to a cross-sectional CT NGO to make it, uh, because it's a cross-sectional, it, it's not a, it's not a DSA diagnosis, it's a cross-sectional diagnosis, you need to have a scaffolding on CPN, which right. uh, our radiology colleagues did not agree, but I did find a, a scaffolding in the cross-sectional CT as well. Okay. Do you have any runs of the post-angioplasty runs? Uh, I think sir, Nishan probably hasn't brought them with this, so, but uh, there they, they was, uh, so I, I remember this case very vividly, we put in a sea guard stent, which is a double layer stent. And uh, there was, uh, as soon as we put in the stent gradually, 
this uh, uh, this uh, thing got balled off from the main circulation and there was still some stasis but it got it got balled off of the balled off from the main circulation and the patient stopped having pain i think we usually do a dsa or a so to see uh, the stent but he hasn't follow up but he, he still uh, he find stent over phone it's been almost 5 months since we have done it right so yeah i think stenting it was a right decision because uh, they do well after stenting uh, if not responding to medical management so exactly so but that's 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 one thing that so uh, uh, on recurrence of carotid web on anticoagulation and antiplatelet is close to 25 to 36% right So, yeah. uh, which is which is quite high, and on stenting is uh, is the mainstay of treatment. And surprisingly, uh, I'm, I'm I'm very I'm, I'm very happy that uh, uh, we are discussing about stenting. Surprisingly, my patients, whenever they have gone, they have been stenting. So uh, that's that's the usual thing that uh, I've been. Uh, so uh, unlike uh, what you used to think, uh, we are finding carotid webs quite. commonly and uh, it's been almost now eight cases i am i'm writing a case series and a review of literature on carotid webs now we have eight cases uh, the the sign is that if the patient has uh, a recurrent stroke in the same vascular territory like it was in the last case i attended the last part of it in, on the p uh, which we diagnosed as pfo so as dr jayantar was was likely uh, rightly saying if you are having stroke in the same vascular territory it is the vessel which is at fault and not the heart so that's that's the that's the rule that we follow that vessel has to be at fault and if it's, it's it's not the heart most of the times and what we have we always go for dsa and gradually we are diagnosing more and more webs uh, and uh, uh, we, we some of them are on anticoagulation because of uh, reasons that they did not want to undergo stenting and uh, three of them are on anticoagulation and they have been doing well as well two of them have been stented and they are doing as well as well. Uh, yeah, I agree because CT and GO <coughs> sometimes encounter some technical difficulties, especially injecting the dye and the timing and a lot of other uh, technical factors. So we might not get a very good CT, CT and GO all the time. So DSA should be gold standard in investigating young stroke patients who are suspecting uh, uh, some some vascular disease somewhere. Completely agree. Completely. Okay. All right. So I think it's a very interesting case, and I'm I'm surprised to see how many carotid waves you are picking up. So that's really interesting. I I I do see maybe one case in two years, and you got eight cases. Yeah. That's yeah. So uh, we'll be we'll be publishing it soon. We are writing. We are having the write up, and uh, one of the lady was having strokes in Guwahati, and uh, like I'll discuss it here. One of my she was uh, the mother of uh, our gastroenterology resident. and she was having same stereotypical symptoms like this young man and she mm. he, she was worked up extensively in guwahati and everything was normal and i told her your mother has a carotid web bring her here we will do a dsa mm-hmm. so we brought her here we did the dsa we found the web <laughs> so now i am i am so certain about carotid webs which which is like i do agree it was very rare and like i am surprised even i am surprised to find so many webs <laughs> webs are chasing <laughs> Okay, so uh, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Yeah, Sain. yeah, Jando. It's a very prototypical case. You know, as the the rule of the thumb is when and when the same territory is affected recurrently, as in the previous case which I was telling, the vessel is the culprit. Culprit. You have to look for the vessel to identify. Is there a factor there? Same right. thing has happened here also, and. Uh, Uh, carotid webs, even though we see not very commonly, but they should be considered in uh, young strokes, same vascular ter- territory, beautifully okay. responding to standing. And Dr. Pradeep, you are being uh, the expert in in the duplex. I mean, yeah. uh, how how do you pick up? What is the pick up rate of carotid web when we, you? We have we have picked up quite quite uh, quite a lot. It is not unco- it is not. Uh, that we cannot pick it up, right? It's not not that we cannot pick it up. It is we we uh, we might have missed at maybe 
if, if you see, not many we have seen, if you have seen around 20, 25 cases of carotid web for the last so many years, you would have picked up at least 13, 14. Right. So how do you sir, differentiate from a uh, like a plaque? Like how do you differentiate on a Doppler? Like is any specific? No, no. See, thing? Here the web as uh, it is it is a very discreet one. It is the, the the thickness, everything, and the echo texture with all these things we can we can find out. Is it more in the B mode? It's more in yeah, yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Is there any question from the audience? Uh, no, sir, there are no questions from the audience. Okay. All right. So, is there any other points or would we like to conclude? Yeah, I think uh, with your, yeah, with your permission. We can, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's already 9.30. I think we can. Okay. So, uh, as usual, sir, this workshop was uh, truly amazing. And I would like to announce uh, the impressive online view come for tonight. It's 4.25. Oh, and, wonderful. <clears throat> wonderful. And our audience must have derived immense benefits from this. Actually, it has been appreciated by more than 20 doctors in the comment section, but uh, uh, though there were no questions. And I would like to thank everyone for sparing uh, uh, some time from your busy schedules, especially on this weekend evening. And uh, I would like to thank and congratulate Dr. Dishan sir, Dr. Vinit sir, Dr. Swalyaha ma'am for their interesting case presentations. A special thanks to Dr. Pradeep sir, Dr. Rodgi sir, Dr. Roy sir for their expert comments and valuable practical insights. Working under your guidance in future programs would be uh, absolute privilege sir. And uh, apologies for some technical issues today. We will definitely work on this. And with these closing remarks, uh, we bring this session to an end. Once again, thank you everyone. Uh, I wish you a very delightful weekend ahead. Good good night. Good Thank night. You. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you everyone. Good night. Good. Bye. Bye.